Hello and welcome to another episode of I Was Just Thinking. And today I am just thinking about the red flags to indicate that you may be listening to a false teacher. Now, this is going to be a little bit different type of video. I have no idea as I get started how long it'll take me to get through this. So if you don't have a lot of time, just hit pause, come back later. And maybe maybe I can zip through it pretty quickly, but I know me. And when I get to talking about stuff, I, I want to drill down a little bit. But there's so much false teaching going on in the world today. There's so much false teaching going on in the Church of America and uh, I know that some of you uh, follow me on my weekly Bible studies on Wednesday nights. Some of you have been participating in what I call the camo conversations, which usually happen on a Friday. And then obviously on Sunday morning at 1030. But today, I'm gonna, this is an episode of I Was Just Thinking. And what I would like to give you here is 10 red flags that would indicate that you are listening to a false teacher. There's so much teaching going on. And it can be deceptive. And we're living in a day where uh, I think we are living in Matthew 24, where if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. We don't want that to be possible. So for those of you who trust me, I know if you're just, just tuning in, you go, well, who is this guy? How do I know he's not a false teacher? And so I, you know that you probably don't have a lot of, can't put a lot of stock in what I'm saying. But those of you who know me and trust me, I want to give you what I would consider the 10 marks of a false teacher, either male or female, whatever they are, the 10 red flags of a false teacher. So let's get started. First of all, the, uh, the first red flag I would talk about would be Old Testament preaching without New Testament light. You, you can't, as a New Testament believer, start pulling Old Testament passages out and apply them to a New Testament life. Because things were radically changed because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of the cross of Christ. So it always worries me when I see a teacher camp out in the Old Testament and does not bring in the New Testament to interpret that. I had a, an experience this week that perfectly illustrates this. I hopped on to YouTube, which I, I, I get a lot of good information off of YouTube. There's a lot of great teaching on YouTube, a lot of good devotional stuff. And just to, to, for my own uh, development, I, I listened to some really good teachers on there. But this particular day, well, it was a couple of days ago, I hopped on and, and you know how if you jump on YouTube, there's several videos come up if you, if you hit your home uh, screen so they can, you know, pick from any of these videos. One of those videos basically said something about spirit spouses. Spirit spouses. I thought, now that's strange, a spirit spouse. I never heard of that concept. So my curiosity caused me to click on it. And within the first few seconds, this teacher that I had never seen before made this claim that he was about to prove biblically that there were spirit spouses where people actually had a spouse who was a spirit, a demonic spirit. And I thought, well, if you're going to prove that biblically, I'm hanging around to listen to that. And so he rushes back to Genesis chapter 6 and he says, you know, the, the uh, sons of God looked upon the daughters of men and they saw they were beautiful and they married them. And as a result of that, a, a race of very great men of valor were came forth out of that intermixing with the sons of God and the daughters of men and he says therefore these sons of gods are de- uh, these sons of God are demons and they are um, marrying or having relations with these human women and they're producing this hybrid half spirit half uh, half human offspring that are giants and the tremendous leap that we, I saw there was you go from the sons of God and the daughters of men, and now you just sort of pull out of the air. The sons of God represent demons. And I don't know anywhere in the Bible where the demons are referred to as the sons of God. Maybe somebody's, there's an obscure Old Testament passage somewhere. I, I, but I, I have, I'm not aware that demons have been called the sons of God. 
it's very likely that, and, and scholars have deba- debated the, the meaning of that passage as long as we've had the Bible, they've debated on who are the sons of God and who are the daughters of men. I personally strongly suspect that the sons of God are the descendants of Adam and the sons of men are the descendants of Cain. And uh, one reason I say that, that this is not a demonic physical relations with women that result in pregnancy is that Jesus said in Matthew 22 and I think again in Mark 12 he says in the resurrection we will be like the angels and we will not have spouses and we we won't be in that romantic relationship anymore this romance is uh, these sexual relationships is something for earth so um and you, you'll see this, I guess I don't want to get off on totally that thing because that, that's out on the far fringe somewhere, I hope. Um, but if you look at these false teachers, when you see someone camp out in the Old Testament and they don't, do not bring in the New Testament to interpret it, you, you, that, to me that's a red flag. I'm not saying that proves that they're a false teacher. It's just one of those I go, I'm a little worried about this guy. Jehovah's Witnesses do this terribly. They just camp in the Old Testament, and they just hardly ever reach into the New Testament to interpret the Old Testament. And so be careful when someone grabs an Old Testament passage and starts going to town with all kinds of applications for New Testament believers unless they are reaching into the New Testament and uh, interpreting and using it to interpret that Old Testament. You just take the Old Testament on face value without the New Testament, without the cross, without the gospel, you're going to have to build an altar somewhere and start sacrificing lambs and calves and all that. See, we are not in the Old Testament. We are a New Testament believer. When you interpret the Old Testament, you've got to do it with the New Testament. Okay, <clears throat> that's one red flag. Uh, the second red flag is there's no real accountability for the leaders. There's no real accountability for the leaders. And um, I believe human nature being what it is, that every spiritual leader needs accountability. There ought to be somebody that can fire him or her if they get out in left field. There ought to be somebody who can challenge them to say, we're not sure about what you're teaching here. You're going to have to help us understand where you're coming from. And the false teachers generally will surround themselves or put themselves in a context where there's no real accountability. They might talk, say they've got advisory councils or advisory boards and coverings and this, but there's no real teeth in that. Now, personally, I, I, I'm, I'm a part of um, the Assemblies of God where there is very strong accountability up the chain of command where if I get out in left field somewhere, there, there's some real accountability locally through a deacon board, uh, sectionally through a sectional, uh, 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 sectional overseer or uh, sectional presbyter. Uh, I have a district superintendent, and you go right on up to the general office. So there, there's layers of accountability that, that I could be challenged on. And if you're non-denominational, you have to really work to put that in place, and it's got to be a, 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 a credible. But false teachers love to operate outside of the realm of accountability because they don't want anybody to challenge them. So be careful if there's no real accountability. The third red flag would be God's blessings are predicated upon money. And you'll, you'll, they'll always circle back to this. If you want God's blessing, you got to give me your money. You know? And so it seems like everything is predicated upon money. That's a red flag. I can tell you now, you don't have to give an offering for God to touch your body when you're sick. You don't have to give an offering for God to hear your prayer when you're struggling. You don't have to give an offering to you know, to sow your, your seed faith, faith, things like that. You don't see Jesus calling for offerings before he performs a miracle, before he relieves someone's pain. You don't see Paul doing that. And Paul does write fundraising letters, and you see parts of the epistles <clears throat> are dedicated to raising funds for his missionary travels. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 9 and in other places. But he does not predicate, God's not going to hear your prayer unless you give. So when you see God's blessings, 
are predicated upon you giving them money, that is a huge, huge red flag. Number four, there's biblical blind spots. False teachers tend to get their favorite little group of scriptures and just go to town with those. And these, all these scriptures that cause them problems, they don't want to deal with those. They don't want to bring those in. They don't want to talk about those. And so there's these huge biblical blind spots. And I'm talking about New Testament biblical blind spots where there's entire subjects that are not being dealt with. Um, you see, you have God. You, you, God is uh, the person of God contains a personality of God. And that personality of God is who we get to know as we study the Word and, and we walk with that God and it's all based on the Word. So the God that we serve is a God of grace. He's a God of love. He's a God of care. He's a God of nurturing. He's also a God of accountability. He's also a God of judgment. He's a God of wrath. He's a God of purity. But false teachers tend to take part of God and eliminate the other part of God. A classic example, and not to beat anybody up, Joel Osteen. If you only listened to Joel Osteen, you would have a profoundly skewed view of God. You would see God as this person who always speaks in delicate little feminine tones and who never had a wrathful inclination whatsoever. And so there's this huge biblical blind spot in his uh, ministry, you know, the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. You know, you, you, you see times where, you know, we, we're, we're told in, in Romans, thank God we have escaped the wrath of God. And so there's these huge biblical blind spots that are created by false teachers because they have a perspective of God that is marketable and that is profitable and that contributes to their celebrity, and they do not want to project anything about God, the biblical God, that would take away from that. So they're willing to sacrifice biblical truth and biblical balance for their own kingdom, their own religious business. And uh, that is a huge, huge red flag. If you're listening to a teacher and you're really participating in that teacher's ministry, and you're finding things in the Bible that he's never mentioned, she's never mentioned, and they're major themes. So much of the Bible talks about the full spectrum of God's personality. And God is inherently not marketable. I mean, we look at Jesus' life. He, he, preaches, he preaches and people get infuriated, you know. But false teachers don't want to go down that path. They won't go down that path. So watch out for that. Number five, we're clipping along pretty good, aren't we? <clears throat> Number five, there's little or no emphasis on eternity. Little or no emphasis on eternity. False teachers build their entire um, house on the here and now. And when you look at your Bible, when you get well-versed in the New Testament, you're going to find the major theme of your Bible, your New Testament Bible, is eternity is racing toward us and we better be ready for it. But false teachers, because they're marketing in the here and now, and usually their goal is to gain money or wealth or fame or something from their followers, they don't talk about eternity. They don't, they don't dwell on eternity. They just maybe mention it in passing once in a while. But if you, if you look at the New Testament, it, it's, it's very emphasis, they're very em emphatic about eternity. So be careful when you're not hearing a lot about eternity. There's an eternal heaven to gain, eternal, eternal hell to shun. And so good, balanced biblical teaching is going to have that issue of eternity front and center. Yes. Um, number six, a rejection of righteous suffering. False teachers are very bad to completely reject the concept of righteous suffering. 
again, it's not marketable, you know, and so they, they tend to kick it to the curb. So you got to be very careful. In fact, I am hearing uh, a lot of very well-known teacher, preacher, evangelist, celebrity, whatever, that are simply coming out and saying, it's just never God's will for you to suffer. It's just never God's will for you to have a, a, a painful experience or a, a dark valley, a difficult time. But again, if you just open your, your, your Bible, the Bible talks about count it all joy when you fall into these seasons of suffering because your faith is being purified and, and refined. And, and man, there's so many New Testament passages that talk about righteous suffering. And uh, the false teachers, they, they, can't, they cannot begin to allow themselves to enter in that realm of, of conceding that there is a biblical basis and a very strong biblical basis for embracing the idea of righteous suffering, of sacrifice, of even martyrdom. You know, people in the Bible even die for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Some of them are tortured and all kinds of terrible things happen to them righteously. But uh, the false teachers cannot fathom that at all. And it is, uh, to me, that is one of the telltale signs of an American false teacher. O other parts of the world, uh, I don't know that they're that bad. You know, if you go into, I've traveled most of my outside the United States traveling has been um, in, in South America, and uh, I, I don't get the feeling that they're all wrapped up into that, that the way that we are here in America, the idea that we should never have to suffer ever. Uh, but that is a red flag, and, and I'm not going to do it right now. I can if you want me to, but I could stack New Testament passage on New Testament passage that validates and confirms that there is righteous suffering among God's people in the New Testament, even if they are filled with faith. So if they will not accept that there's righteous suffering, you've got a false teacher on your hand there, or at least a deceived one. <coughs> Where are we now? Are we at number seven? And I, I'll need to explain this one a little bit because the, the verbiage is not explanatory. So let me, let me explain this one a little bit. Here it is, number seven, the projection of revelation certainty. The projection of revelation certainty. And what I mean by that is they project that their spiritual revelations are actually absolutely certain. In fact, you kind of get the feeling that they've sort of stacked them up there at the same level of Scripture at times. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, now we know imperfectly, now we prophesy imperfectly, we look through the glass darkly, you know, but when perfection comes, then that which is imperfect will be done away with. And then he goes on to say in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians that when someone prophesies or has a revelation, that the others in the church should judge it. They should evaluate it. They should test it and see if it's truly of God. But a false teacher will put this out there as if, man, there's no doubt this came from God. A true teacher, a, someone who is truly walking in the Spirit, I believe carries the revelation with some humility, and they will say, I believe the Lord impressed this upon me. I could be wrong if I am. If you don't bear witness with it, then, then you, you're free to reject this. You know, We're not in the Old Testament where they stone people if their prophecies didn't come true. But a false teacher will project, God said this, I know God said this. You can, you can take this to the bank. Well, that's not uh, what the Scripture teach, teaches about the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit operate imperfectly because we are imperfect. Uh, we have a little bit of trouble discerning perfectly what a perfect God is saying. 
So if you are listening to someone who says, God said, and I had this dream, and I had this vision, and I had this prophecy, and, and X, Y, Z, and you can take this to the bank, you, that's a red flag. It's a, it's a gr- big red flag that you probably are listening to someone who is pretty dangerous. Because whether we want to admit it or not, as spirit-filled believers, we must always be careful to admit that we can miss it. That what we thought was the voice of God was actually our own thoughts, maybe our own desires, uh, maybe our own agenda. That's why we go through a process of praying about it and maybe submitting it to other people. Do you bear witness with this? Be careful with people who project revelation certainty. Those people can be very, very, very dangerous. I can't emphasize that enough. The eighth red flag I see when it comes to uh, false teachers is that the mission is replaced by the miraculous. The mission is replaced by the miraculous. So Jesus tells us to go into the whole world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that people will come to Jesus and they will be saved <clears throat> our, our mission is to preach Jesus. Now, we see in Paul's life, in Peter's life, certainly in Jesus' life, we see that miracles accompanied the proclamation of the gospel. And that's very important. Miracles accompanied the proclamation of the gospel. They did not become the proclamation. And so when you have ministries that spend the entire sermon trying to hype you up to receive your miracle, you got a problem there. That is some kind of circus marketing technique to try and whip people up into some kind of frenzy so they can gain some more control over them and again, probably get more money out of them. Um, But miracles are peripheral to the gospel. And so many times in these false teachers, miracle, 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 miracle. I've, I've listened to sermon after sermon where all they talked about was God's power to heal, God's power. To, and I think, well, what about God's power to save? What, God, what about God's power to deliver people from darkness, from evil? You know, that's the real message that we should be doing. And, and I, I said something some time ago, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how it went down, but I'm going to say it again because I, I, still, I still believe it. I concede that in the gifts of the Spirit, Paul said some operate in the gifts of healings. And they're both plural. Gifts is plural in the original language and healing is plural. So he said there are people who operate in the gifts of healings and some the gift of prophecy, some the, the gift of tongues, the interpretation of tongues, discerning of spirits. You, you have all those things. But when you see that those giftings lived out, uh, what you see is those giftings are lived out uh, alongside of or consequential to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I had a young lady to say to me one time that she felt that God was calling her into a ministry of, of the miraculous healings. And uh, I... She spent a few moments just visiting with her, and I said, you know, it's, it's kind of strange that you feel God calling you into a ministry of miraculous healings when there's no record of anybody ever being called to that in the Bible. You know, Paul had miracles happening in his life, but he was called to share Jesus with the Gentiles. Peter saw miracles happening in his life, but he was called to carry the gospel to the Jews. Um, Those those miracles were happening uh, consequential to the preaching. They accompanied the preaching. They weren't the preaching. And when you are listening to someone who's all wrapped up in miracles, and, you know, my theory is the reason that we don't see more bona fide miraculous healings is because of what it does to us when it happens. We, we turn things into this strange uh, 
celebrity. Oh, so they prayed for some, somebody who healed. And you know, I want you to remember that when Jesus was healing, he told people, don't tell anybody about this. Just, just enjoy your healing and, and go on. Don't, don't, don't tell anybody about this. Man, we have such a, a opposite of that now. Be careful when the message of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the Savior, is being replaced by the message, come and have a miracle. Come and get a miracle. This infatuation with the miraculous at the expense of the mission is, a, to me, a definite red sign, a red flag that there is something going wrong in that teaching. Okay, we're ready for number nine. This is going to sound a little bit technical, but um, I call number nine fake linguistic expertise. Fake linguistic expertise. Watch for fake linguistic expertise. And let me just tell you what I'm talking about here. I have noticed that a lot of false teachers pretend to know Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic when in truth they don't know it at all. Now, just to toot my own horn a little bit, um, I, I have a master's degree in New Testament Greek. Um, back in the 80s and 90s when I was doing my, my uh, formal training, I got a minor in biblical language in college, and then I went right into our seminary in Springfield and, and got a uh, master's in, in biblical languages with a concentration in New Testament Greek. So, and I've used that every week, every since. I, 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 I analyze the Greek text uh, when I prepare a, a, a sermon. And what I found, uh, knowing a fair amount of Greek and Hebrew, or mostly Greek, Hebrew, it's been hard to keep up with it. But what I have found is that a lot of false teachers pretend to know Greek when they don't. Let me give you an example. The word rhema, rhema. Uh, a lot of people say that is the creative word of God. It's a rhema, not like logos. It's the creative word of God. It's what comes out of well, that's just not true. You know, in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That would seem to be a very good place for God to use rhema. But instead, He uses logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the Word it was God. So the idea that rhema is some special word for word and logos is a more generic that's not true another example agape god's kind of love that's not true agape is an intense form of love but when the bible says love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man loves the world the wor the love of the father is not in him it uses agape throughout that. So you can agape the world. You can agape sin. You can agape darkness. So the idea that agape is God's pure kind of love is simply not true if you know it. So, and I know it's, it might be hard for you to get that, but be careful. Most of those false teachers, those uh, uh, people who are claiming to have all this knowledge, Really, they don't know anything about linguistics. They, they, in fact, they have formed a so what I call a superstitious linguistic conviction. What they're saying is that there's power in those specific, those sp specific. And get my tongue tied here. Those sp specific words. But the truth is that God chose to write the New Testament in a very common everyday language. It's called Koine Greek, and Koine means common. We get a word coin. It means common, everyday. It was the language of commerce in the Roman Empire. So there, there, there is not, the concept is what's sacred. You, you can't grab agape and start waving it around and, and have it do something special. It's just words, and there's concepts in, in those words that are so sacred and so holy and so precious. But if, if it were the actual word that is so sacred and, and all that, I'm talking about the phonetic, phonetical word, then you'd have something um, sort of superstitious and mystical. 
And that sometimes leads people into, they like this translation or that translation because they get hung up on words. But um, uh, fake teachers, false teachers, false prophets, they tend to fake a, an expertise in biblical languages. And it's, it's, they simply don't have it, if you, if you know what you're talking about. And uh, then finally, number 10, uh, religious syncretism. Religious syncretism. And I found that, and this may be a good capstone to, to put on this study, I have found that um, people, if they're not very careful, stumble into, I guess I should define syncretism. Syncretism is when you bring pieces of different religions together and assimilate them into your religion. So when there is Christian syncretism, and I use the word Christian in quotations there, uh, you're bringing stuff from other religions and plugging it into it. Now, you have a, an epidemic of syncretism going on in the faith movement, and you have for quite a while. It's really getting bad now. In fact, uh, if you really analyze the faith movement, you have a, a core of New Age mysticism in it, the law of attraction, where sending out good vibes and good vibes come back to you. That's not faith. That's not the word of faith. That is the New Age cult. And, and there's all kinds of different elements of the New Age cult. The witchcraft of New Age is being brought into the faith movement. And because people are, are not paying attention, it gets real scary at this point. I, I, I see people doing things, basically turning God into a, a, a superstitious being. Uh, last night when I got home, I got the mail out of the mailbox and uh, I noticed there was a thick envelope and uh, I thought that's kind of, and I started rifling through it and, and the thing asked me, before you go any further, unfold this rug, this little rug out, put it on the floor and kneel down on this rug. It's been specially blessed and uh, then Jesus is going to respond to you kneeling on this rug that has been, and I'm not making this up. It was actually in my mailbox last yesterday. Uh, God is going to respond to this rug you're kneeling on, and th these things are going to happen. And um, and what you have there is superstition. You have cultic. I, I watered it all up and threw it in the fireplace. You know, it, it has no place in my life. Superstition has no place in my life. I'm not going to practice witchcraft and call it faith. <clears throat> and so much of the faith movement today is new age repackaged and given some Christian verbiage to make it sound more um, Christianized. But it's syncretism. You, you really have to watch this. You have to be careful about this. In fact, I, I thought about doing a, 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 list, a little bit of a study on the things from... Um, from the New Age movement that have come over into the um, into the preaching and teaching of the modern American church, so watch for syncretism when people are bringing stuff in from other religions and attaching them. I'm going to tell you, friends, God is spirit. Though those who worship Him worship Him in spirit and in truth. If you're buying a splinter off the cross. Or you're buying a specially prayed over rug to kneel on. That's all witchcraft. That's, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, uh, be careful about that. So here are 10 red flags that you are likely listening to a false teacher. I hope you find them beneficial. Uh, I always welcome your feedback, your input. And uh, so hopefully this is a blessing to you. It, it really is a time and a day where we have to be especially careful not to be deceived. If it were possible, the very elect will be deceived in these last and dark days. So make it impossible for yourself to be deceived. And I hope these little warning statements will serve as something to help you not be deceived. God bless you. I'll see you next time on the next episode of I Was Just Thinking.